MSNBC is so desperate to uh, slam dunk on the Trump trial in New York that they even called Michael Avenatti from prison to get him to pile on. But it didn't actually go the way MSNBC was hoping. We're going to play that for you. Plus, a trans activist is very upset that a news anchor refuses to use their pronouns. And it's delicious. Also, uh, Coleman Hughes, remember him when he was very calm and reasonable? With the ladies of The View, well, he had an appearance with Joe Rogan, and, well, he did himself one better than his last appearance. It's a great, great conversation about the truth going on in Israel. We're going to share that with you, too, and quite a bit more. we got a lot to cover. Let's get right to it. I'm Larry O'Connor. This is Larry. Before we cover it all, I do want you to please continue to give us support here and keep our videos promoted. Uh, that's because you like it. You just hit the thumbs up. It's so easy. Just test your mouse real fast to make sure that it's working and click the thumbs up like button. Even better, you can subscribe or copy and paste this link onto your social media so that other people can see it. We really appreciate that. Any of the segments that we do today that you really like, you can circle back and see them on YouTube or Rumble, where we're live right now as we are every day. Copy that link and put it onto your social media and like and subscribe uh, to those well, you only subscribe once, but like all of those videos too. It really does help us out. And all of your support and all the comments have been really encouraging, not just for the team that put together this show, but for all of us at Town Hall Media. That includes your favorite sites, townhall.com, hotair.com, redstate.com, pjmedia.com, twitchy.com, and bearingarms.com. All right, let's get right to it. Right now, the, the hottest of all of the cases that they've been throwing at Donald Trump appears to be the most bogus of them all. This is the one that you'll hear described as a hush money case. It's it's not hush money. Why Even Fox News and Newsmax and these other conservative outlets use this term. It's a hush money case. It's not hush money. Donald Trump entered into a legal non-disclosure agreement with an individual, as so many other people do. I guarantee you that every single anchor you see reading a teleprompter and says, hush money, have gotten some sort of payment or paid a payment of some sort over the years by signing a non-disclosure agreement. Oftentimes, it's embedded into your contract. When you work for a media company, there's a paragraph there that talks about non-disclosure. And in exchange for that non-disclosure, you get paid extra money or a higher salary. It's a lie. That said, this is the case that seems to be getting all of the traction right now. MSNBC, they're so desperate to give wall-to-wall -wall coverage and to dunk on Trump that they even picked up the phone and called prison. They called prison to get Michael Avenatti on the phone. He, of course, was, as Tucker Carlson called him, the creepy porn lawyer who took up the case of Stormy Daniels and now... Well, he's in jail because he defrauded and took advantage of and stole from Stormy Daniels. But that doesn't bother MSNBC. Hey, he can trash Trump, so let's get him on the air. And then after he has what he has to say, we'll turn to Republican Ronna Romney McDaniel to give her analysis. Oh, no, 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 that's right. We couldn't possibly have Ronna McDaniel on, the former chairwoman of the RNC. She's odious. She makes us all feel icky. She's terrible. It defies our journalistic ethics and standards to have Ronna McDaniel on. So let's just talk to the incarcerated, convicted, creepy porn lawyer, shall we? Oh, MSNBC, you make us all proud as a peacock. Uh, it's good to have you. We have a lot of news to get to. Uh, but first, how are you holding up? Well, as uh, as Elton John once wrote, I'm still standing, Ari. I'm uh, I'm doing fine, and uh, but maybe maybe when you're in a men's prison, you shouldn't refer to uh, Elton John. <laughs> Just say it. If I were you, I would not be singing Elton John songs at mealtime there in the men's prison, Michael. And I'm glad you're still standing, but it's probably because you know after yesterday's shower experience, it's uh, not very comfortable to sit. Anyway, back to Avenatti. You know, to those. Uh, who were hoping that perhaps this, the last few years would, uh, you know, ultimately destroy me. I've got some bad news for them, and that is that it hasn't. Uh, mm. I'm going to come out of this uh, better and stronger than ever, and, uh, you know, every day I strive to make sure that this does not define me. No, no, this is definitely going to define you. You've been defined. Of course, for MSNBC, your only definition that matters is that you hate Donald Trump. So, of course, we're going to welcome you with open arms and but, but for the rest of us, for most of us, for the people that actually have morals and ethics, no, no, you've been defined. Congratulations. That said, listen, 
I, we pray for Michael Avenatti and his soul. Uh, I hope that actually he does have some sort of real reformation, some sort of real enlightenment while he's in prison and actually changes his ways. And uh, while he's at it, maybe he can turn his life over to the Lord or something like that. But short of that, mm, yeah, he's still a creepy porn lawyer. Uh, I believe this will be ultimately, you know, a chapter in a in a very long book as opposed to the book. Understood. Uh, and you join us at a very newsworthy time. Uh, some of your lawyering uh, led to the exposure of the evidence in this case. Uh, the I'm sorry. I swear I'm going to let them finish. But your lawyering led to the exposure of this. You know, the lawyering that you then raised millions of dollars on and then defrauded your client and never gave to g gave to her the money that you went on television raising money for so that you could get Trump. And then, of course, nothing came of it. Your civil trial dried up and nothing came of it because really your lawyering amounted to you enriching yourself and defrauding your own client, who, by the way, violated her nondisclosure act. So it's kind of hard for you as a lawyer to make money on your client whose sole act in this entire escapade was to violate the contract she entered into years ago. And oh, by the way, even the U.S. attorney looked at the so-called evidence that you gathered through your lawyering, dismissed this and said there's no charges. It only was when Alvin Bragg, the Soros funded a district attorney in Manhattan, who was desperate to get Donald Trump and have some kind of headline that didn't involve stabbing shootings and public defecation on the sidewalks of Manhattan? Did he twist and bastardize the law, turn what was a misdemeanor now into a felony and try to try federal election fraud cases, which is supposed to be the federal uh, Justice Department's jurisdiction, into a criminal case in the island of Manhattan? But it was all your lawyering, Michael Avenatti. We'd be nowhere without you. This is so pathetic. And it gets worse because this is where MSNBC's hopes and dreams are shattered because they were so ready for Michael Avenatti to tell them how Trump was going to the big house. Trump's going to be his cellmate there because of all of the horrible crimes that he committed. And, well, it didn't go that way for MSNBC. Here it is. Uh, the New York trial now will be Donald Trump's first and possibly only trial this year. Um, how do you assess the strength of the prosecution's case? Well, I think what I'm about to say is going to surprise a lot of people, and that is that, um, you know, I think this is the wrong case at the wrong time, Ari. Um, I, I think that the case is in many ways stale at this juncture. You're talking about conduct that occurred some eight years ago. Uh, I think the uh, fact that it's occurring in state court in New York uh, is a mistake. Uh, and I think that when you are going to uh, potentially deprive tens of millions of Americans uh, of their choice for the presidency of the United States, whether we agree with those folks or not, or regardless of what we may think of Donald Trump, I think it's a mistake to do it based on a case of this nature. Hmm. Um, I, I was hoping, frankly, that uh, there would have been less hand-wringing, uh, less bedwetting, and that the January 6th case would have been filed in a more timely manner. There's no excuse or reason as to why that case could not have been brought in 2021, and it should have been brought in 2021. And had it been brought in 2021, we would not find ourselves in the situation that we're in right now. Now, I know a lot of people have been critical of the United States Supreme Court and uh, as well as the second, uh, not the second, but the D.C. Circuit. Yep. You know, I, I think those complaints are frankly misplaced. And Michael, have you been in touch with D.A. Bragg's office and what specifically in, in evidence or logic uh, do you think is wrong with this case? Well, I'm going to decline to answer as to whether I've been in touch with, you know, either the defense or um, the DA's office. But but let me say this in response to the second part of your question. You know, I, I, I think the, the case has a lot of problems. Now, that, that does not – I don't mean to suggest that that means that Trump will not be convicted, because I think he will be convicted, hmm. because, number, because, number one – He's a criminal defendant, and in our society, I don't believe the criminal defendants generally get a fair shake. In fact, I think that the percentage of convictions demonstrates that, that the deck is stacked decidedly against all criminal defendants, um, number one. Number two, I don't think that he can get a fair trial in New York. 
And to the people who claim that, in fact, he can get a fair trial in New York with a New York jury, I would ask them if they were to sleep, go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow and find out that the case had been moved to Mississippi or Alabama, would they still think that the trial was going to be fair? And I think if they were being honest, they would answer no. So I don't think he can get a fair trial in in New York. So there you go. Michael Avenatti not really giving MSNBC what they were looking for. This is a bad case. It's eight years old. The evidence doesn't support it. Now, don't get me wrong. He's probably still going to get convicted, but only because the entire thing is rigged. And if it weren't in New York, he probably would be acquitted. And oh, by the way, that whole Jack Smith case, the prosecution over January 6th, they should have done it in 2021, you know, right after the events occurred, because literally nothing changed between 2021 and where we are right now, where it still hasn't gone to trial. But, you know, they took too long for it. Now it's going to get hung up with the Supreme Court and other findings. If they had tried him in 21, then it would have timed out better. But, of course, the only reason they waited until now is because this has nothing to do with the law or with anyone breaking the law or any criminal purposes. It's all to do with politics. And, well, this year is the presidential election because this case really doesn't have anything to do with with anything having to do with justice. It has to do with winning an election. Okay, those last parts I added on from Michael Lab Benatti, but we read between the lines. It's it's glorious that MSNBC won't have a Republican like the chairwoman of the co- committee on the Republican National Committee or most congressmen or senators aren't allowed on either. But the one person that they want to bring on to talk about the Donald Trump case is literally a convicted felon. Live from jail, it's Michael Avenatti. Meanwhile, it's true, this is probably the only case that we'll see the inside of a courtroom that a jury will hear with regard to Donald Trump prior to the election, and it's quite possible and probable that he will be convicted. That said, everything Michael Avenatti just told you, shockingly, is true, and that's why Eric Trump, the son of the president, appeared on Fox & Friends this morning and said, you know, we're going to win in the long run on all this stuff. If If it comes to Donald Trump, He no longer has a freedom of speech, according to these courts. And it's um, he'll take this all the way to the Supreme Court. He'll take as far as he needs. And he's got an amazing voice and he will come in here and he's going to win the cases. And um, and Brian, he's going to win this presidency. Six six months, you believe you're going to six months out. You believe you're going to win. I know we're going to win. I know we're going to win because I I, I know where this country is. I, I, I can feel the sentiment of the country. Um, and people are not buying what's happening right now. Um, the mainstream media, they'll keep on peddling their nonsense, but Americans are upset. Right. This country is going down the tube. Um, and they miss right. the guy who did a great job for this nation, which was Donald Trump. And he's going to be back in office. I right. guarantee it. And I'd just be very curious to see if he wins again, uh, if you'll be joining him this time. Uh, and we'll see if you're the, the Trump that goes or the Trump that stays. Yeah. Great to see you, Eric. Thanks always so much, fantastic. Brian. Appreciate you. It's always great. The Trump that goes or the Trump that stays. I think that's a reference to who ends up working in the White House. It was Ivanka last time around. Uh, We'll see what happens. I think she said that she doesn't want to work in the White House again after her last experience, you know, because she was beloved by Manhattan and fashion circles and design circles. And and even she appeared on the covers of magazines right up until the point her father ran for president. And then, of course, she was well, she was removed from public society. That's what the left does. You know, financial experts thought we were in the clear just last month. They were hoping to get an interest rate, one of six interest rate reductions this year because inflation was finally under control. Then the inflation numbers came up and it increased again. In fact, we just got inflation numbers today too. And well, they're up again. Now we're going to be lucky to get three interest rate reductions this year, if at all. This problem is not going away. You can bury your head in the sand or you can actually do something about it. We're $34 trillion in debt. And with the people in charge right now in Washington, D.C., well, they're just going to keep spending money that we don't have. And it's not even our children's money. It's our children's children's money that they're spending. That's why the cost of everything is going up. That's why inflation has not abated. So what are you going to do about it? Well, how about diversify a portion of your savings into gold? Let's talk about Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge against inflation. Birch Gold makes it easy to own. They'll help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. And you don't pay a penny out of pocket. 
They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, thousands of satisfied customers. You can trust Birch Gold, too. Text Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, text Larry to 989898. Get yourself a free info kit on gold. Talk to a precious metal specialist and learn how you can protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Once again, text Larry. You see it right there? Text Larry to 989898. All right. In England, they've been having on they've been having an ongoing conversation about the fact that the National Health Service there has finally, beautifully, wonderfully, heroically, courageously, scientifically stopped the use of puberty blockers and a so-called a chemical gender transition pharmaceuticals, as well as the medical procedures on children to give them so-called gender-affirming care, which, of course, Orwellian speak, gender-affirming care literally does the opposite. It does not affirm anything that a person was born as. It actually transforms and mutilates the healthy individual from a healthy man to a healthy woman or a healthy woman to a healthy man, or excuse me, a, a manufactured woman or a manufactured man. Uh, so they've been having an ongoing conversation in that country about the National Health Service making that decision. And an amazing moment happened on uh, Talk TV last night. It's a, a right-leaning video outlet. I think Piers Morgan has his show there, um, Nigel Farage. I can't remember if he's on Talk TV or GBTV. Uh, but on Talk TV, uh, the host of a show had a transgender activist on. Uh, and, well, the host dared to call this activist uh, she or her, referred to her with a pronoun that was in line with their actual biological makeup. And that's when things got a little ugly. Good afternoon, Julia. Thanks. You know my pronouns are they, them. How are you doing? Yeah. Um, thank you for telling me your pronouns. I use correct grammar. So the only, only thing I would need to refer you to is for, to your face would be you. But I'm, I'm not being rude. You can choose your pronouns. You can choose what you want to call yourself, but you don't, have a, you don't get to require me to use incorrect grammar and factually incorrect things. You're not a plural. You're a, you're a, you're a one person. And you're a, you're a female person, so I will use she and her. Thank you very much. Do what you like, I guess. Well, there you are. You didn't need to tell me then, did you? Maybe I'm just making sure people know in case they're watching and they want to refer to me respectfully. Is it disrespectful for me to use correct factual grammar? It's not incorrect or unfactual grammar to use singular they, them pronouns for an individual. But we're here to talk about the cast review. Yeah, but, but, you, but, you, chose, but you chose to bring it up. You chose to use the incorrect pronouns for me. I I'm chose to use the correct pronouns for a single woman who is appearing on my show. I'm not a single woman, though. I'm a very special non-binary trans person, as you just pointed out. I, I didn't really just point that out. The crowd. I didn't just point that out. I introduced you as a journalist and a virgin radio presenter. No, just before I came on, you were talking about how people with all these labels like mm. to be special. And I'm just making sure that everyone knows I'm special. Okay, I'm not special. I'm just a boring old heterosexual married woman. But, you know, sorry about that. We're not allowed to do that anymore. In fact, that probably does make me special now. I don't know. This is beautiful. And I'm so happy that she actually, because you notice this uh, guest, Shivani Dave, uh, da uh, Davi, sorry, Shivani Davi wanted to just, okay, let's just move on now. Let's talk about the topic. She's like, no, 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 I'm not going to let you get away with this. Why are you why are you forcing me to use the language imprecisely just to accommodate your narcissism? This is what needs to be done whenever possible. Listen, if a person wants to change their name, fine. I'll call you whatever name you want to be called. It's not up to me to tell you. You know, we're we're all talking about this uh, FBI investigation into Sean Combs, right? And it's great seeing people. It's Puff Daddy. No, it's Diddy. No, it's it's uh, Daddy Combs, or it's it's P Diddy, or it's like it's like how many times has this guy changed his name? So it's like, well, go whatever you want to change your name, but you can't force me to misuse the English language, especially a Brit. They don't like that sort of thing. They think they invented English, yeah, you know, sort of, but they haven't quite got it right. By the way, I do want to show you this. I, I brought up Shivani Davi's website, shivanidavi.co.uk. And you can see right up here in the upper right-hand corner, we got this. It says um, Davi, pronunciation, Davi, excuse me, pronouns they, them, right? Pronouns they, them. So there it is. But then when you read the bio, 
It's amazing. I did a search on this. There is no they, them referenced in the entire bio. Every time it says something, Shivani is a journalist, broadcaster, and physicist in Gen Z because apparently people care about that. In the evenings, they, oh, there it is. Oh, I missed that one. They moonlight as Dishy Sumac, unelected drag prime minister. What terrible policy and even worse gas was. On the weekend, Shivani brings you the music to kick back at Virgin Radio. Shivani is the Radio Academy is this. Shivani is that. Everywhere down. It's just, it's torturous. How often, how, uh, every single time. Here, upon graduating from University of Nottingham with a physics degree, Shivani went on to complete an MSc at Imperial College London. This is like very rarely do they even use they, them on their own bio because it's clunky and stupid and it's poor grammar and it makes no sense. What you just saw, though, in England is a far cry what we saw here in America with this guy, Jake Tapper. He, him, I think. Jake Tapper did a segment. Look how serious he is. He's furrowed his brow. He's wearing his glasses. Take him seriously, damn it. He did a segment on how the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, which is sort of the junior version of the NCAA, has banned transgender athletics. Uh, really, let's face it, banned biological men from competing as women. It doesn't really apply to biological women who would compete on a man's team because no biological woman could be on a man's team. So this is really about keeping women's sports fair for women. But look at how he handled the segment with a transgender activist. It's a little different. Joining us now to discuss is journalist and author of Fair Play, How Sports Shape the Gender Debate Katie Barnes. Katie, thank you for joining us. What do you make of the NAIA's new transgender participation policy? Well, I think it is reflective of the times that we are in, in terms of for the last you know, three or four years, we have seen most policy updates when it comes to transgender athletes be reflective of restriction and in favor of more restrictive policy. And this seems to fall right in line with that. There is a narrative um, that transgender female athletes have an advantage, uh, that they always win, um, that the reason that men and women generally compete in separate gender categories is because it's not particularly competitive for men to compete against women. Do studies support that? You have to be Jake Tapper to have to ask if studies support something that is so obvious on the face of it. And did you notice the, the idea that it's not fair for women to compete against biological men who are identifying as women? Uh, that That's not a, a um, case that's been made. It's not an argument. It's not a, a position. It's a narrative. That's how Jake Tapper described it, a narrative. So when Riley Gaines and all of her teammates at the University of Kentucky swim team or all of the young women who lost in a swim match to Leah Thomas because he's, you know, six, four with a wingspan, like a seven thirty seven because he's a biological man who's gone through puberty and has the bone density and men, uh, muscle capacity that a little five foot woman is never going to have that if they are complaining about that and say it's, it's absolutely impossible and unfair to have to compete against this person, that that's not uh, the truth. It's not fact. It's not even their position or their feeling. It's a, a narrative. It's a narrative, Jake Tapper. By the way, this person, uh, Katie Barnes, uh, is an ESPN reporter as well. So, you know, it's all about the truth and facts when you're a journalist at ESPN. Well, I think it depends on what you mean by support that. You know, for my reporting and having you know, really reported this out for many years, the reality is, is that from a scientific perspective, we know that there are differences in sexes and we know that the differences um, do tend to lead to athletic performance differences as well. However, when we look at broad-based restriction um, at all levels of sport, it's very challenging to say that scientifically that is supported in all cases, uh, meaning that something that might be appropriate for swimming does not necessarily apply to basketball um, when it comes to individual sports versus team sports, as well as level of competition. And so the idea, I think, that transgender women have 
an advantage in all sports at all times, regardless of any kind of medical transition, I don't think that the scientific literature supports that at this time. Now, you realize that, of course, wasn't the question, number one. Number two, the scientific literature doesn't support it because this is kind of a minute and a half old and there hasn't been a whole lot of scientific studies. And those scientists, by the way, who do wish to study this are exiled from their profession because those professions are more interested in politics and the woke intersectional ladder that one must climb to get to the top of academia or science these days rather than actually finding the truth. But that was a real fine use of words to dodge the obvious issue here, which is, on average, on any given day, will a biological man even go have, who has gone through a gender transition, will they have an athletic event advantage over a biological woman? Which is really the only question to ask. Not to be framed in a narrative, Jake Tapper, and not with the hyperbolic rhetoric that you added, which is, well, these people say that that women are always going to lose and that there's always an advantage. Like, no, 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 no. Let's be specific. On any given day, will the average biological man be able to compete with and beat the average biological woman? That's the only thing that's at play here. I'm sorry. No, listen, Caitlin Clark from the University of Iowa, women's basketball player, probably can shoot better than maybe... 20% of the men in college basketball, but she can't jump higher. She might be able to handle the ball better than a good portion of the basketball players in men's basketball. But, but generally speaking, can she play? Can, can Caitlin Clark, the greatest women's basketball player in college basketball history, could she play on the worst men's team in men's college basketball and compete at the same level? You know the answer to that question. And even better, the worst men's basketball team, the team that got, let's not say the worst, but the, the first team out of the NCAA college basketball men's championship this year, what would that be? Team number 66 out of the field of 66. Could they beat the University of South Carolina women's team that just won the championship? And I'm willing to bet that they could. That's what this is about. Jake Tapper refuses to acknowledge that. Would there be a way to come up with a rule that was more individual specific or sports specific that might not be? I mean, it sounds as though you're you're, you're suggesting, and and if I'm putting words in your wrong, I apologize. In your in your mouth, I apologize. <laughs> it sounds like you're suggesting this policy is not necessarily fair, uh, given uh, how blanket it is. Is there a way to do something like this that would be more fair and more reflective of what is? factually known about gender differences in different sports, et cetera? You know, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's right for me to say whether or not this particular policy is fair. I think <clears throat> that right now where we are as a society is really grappling with what does fair and appropriate policy look like? And in general, most athletic organizations and many states across the country are embracing a blanket restriction. And I think there are a lot of people raising questions about whether or not that is fair and appropriate policy in all cases. You know, uh, we're, we're done with this for the time being, but I, I just, again, this person is an activist and a journalist for ESPN, which tells you everything you need to know about that entity and that cable station and how they address these issues. Sage Steele isn't allowed to have a voice at ESPN, but this person is. Uh, the the biggest problem here and the biggest issue in this entire interview is not that person. It's Jake Tapper. It's Jake Tapper trying to be a fair and equal-minded journalist, which, of course, he isn't and never has been, and try to present both sides of this compelling issue. Is there a way to do this in a fair basis? And the only response you can get is, well, you have to redefine what fair means. Well, why not? We're defining redefining what man and woman means. So how about we just redefine what fair means as well? And then as long as it accommodates me and my political desires and my political goals, that's what fair means. And that's what we're going to do. And everyone will just call it fair. And if you don't think it's fair, well, it's because you're too ignorant to know what fair really means. That's what we're doing here. And Jake Tapper, to begin this entire conversation, which is about the whole thing is supposed to be about college sports. 
about college men's sports and college women's sports. And the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics has decided that only biological men can play in men's sports and only biological women can play in women's sports. That's the whole point of this. So if I've got an ESPN journalist on, to talk about this, I will start for my viewers, I would start at the beginning and say, before we get into this policy, can you just help us out here? Why do we have separate sports for men and women at the college level in the first place? Please answer that. I'm begging you. Please, transgender activist, please give me your expert opinion on that. Why, when we originated college athletics and there was only men's athletics for a while and then women wanted to play too, why did we decide that men's athletics and women's athletics would have to be separate? If you can answer that question, I think everything else falls into place. But between how the Brits handled their transgender activists compared to how Jake Tapper gave a full body massage to his transgender activist, we'll leave you with this. Kamala Harris certainly has her own opinion about this issue, but what's most important to her right now is that elementary children get to see as much gay porn in their libraries as possible. All right, had it or hit it, book bans. Oh God, had it, had it, had it, had it. Again, the idea that you would restrict information and, um, and you know, the same people who are doing that are this, you know, some of the same people who are denying our history, I mean, are trying to kind of just whitewash it. And it's, I think it's absolutely, you know, horrible. The same people who are trying to uh, ban books, of course, nobody's trying to ban books. You want to give your children gay porn, go ahead and buy it with your own money. We're just using discretion to keep it out of a school library. That's not a book ban. That's actually being an adult and using discretion. We're trying to keep information from people. Really, do you have Hustler magazines? Is there still a Hustler magazine? Am I dating myself now? Does porn still come in magazine form? I'd ask Kevin, but he has no idea. I assure you. He's not that kind of guy. The point is, do we do we have archive Hustler magazines or Playboy magazines in the libraries? Because if you don't, you're keeping information from children. Why? Why are you in the in the business of keeping information? But my the favorite part there was the same people who were doing this are the people who are whitewashing and denying our history. Yeah, you know, the people who are tearing down statues left and right around this country for their own political purposes. Wait, those aren't the same people, are they? Wait, who's whitewashing and changing our history again? I'm so confused. I can't keep it straight. Thank God Kamala Harris is smarter than all of us. Isn't she? Sure she is. When last we saw scholar and journalist Coleman Hughes, he was at the table with the ladies of The View. You remember when Sonny Hostin was trying to teach him a lesson about what Martin Luther King really stood for and believed? Because after all, she knows Martin Luther King's daughter. Meanwhile, Coleman Hughes actually is a scholar, researched Martin Luther King and dared to put out a book that said, you know, if we really want to advance things in race relations in this country, maybe we should actually judge each other on the content of our character instead of the color of our skin. Yeah, you remember that guy. Well, that guy just sat down with Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan. Uh, Joe Rogan started with a conversation about uh, what's going on in Israel. And actually, this is coming on the heels of a podcast where Joe Rogan was comparing Israel's action in Gaza with Hamas, saying that they're on the brink of genocide. And Coleman Hughes, Coleman Hughes came ready for that conversation. And you need to see it, not just for what Coleman Hughes says, but pay close attention to how Joe Rogan takes this information, digests it and what he does with it. I, I, I listened to your podcast with Kurt Metzger, who who I know and I've been on his podcast, had a great time on his pod. He's a fun dude. He is. Uh, but I think I disagree with you both kind of on the Israel issue, on the, the idea, there was one point where you were kind of saying it's almost as if the Jews are doing what was done to them, well, as if I'm, it's genocide. I'm saying that when you're killing 30,000 innocent civilians, in response to something that killed 1,200 innocent civilians, and you're continuing to bomb an area into oblivion, mm. which is what it looks like mm. when you're looking at Gaza. 
there's many people that have made the argument that that is at least the steps of genocide or a form of genocide. You're, you're destroying thousands and thousands of people's homes and, and killing them. So when you say 30,000 civilians, it's not 30,000 civilians that have been killed, though. How many th thousands have been killed? So according to ha uh, Gaza Health Ministry, which mm -hmm. is it is run by Hamas, the number they have is 32,000. But they don't distinguish between Hamas and civilians. How so, many members of Hamas are there? 40, 50, uh, 40,000, something like that. It's, I don't think the number is known, but it's tens of thousands. So ha Hamas says 32,000 people have been killed, mm -hmm. civilians and soldiers. Israel says 13,000 soldiers have been killed by Israel. So okay. if you just being, let's not doubt either number. They could both be well, inflated. But, let, but, but if the, both of those numbers are accurate, which they may or may not be, that would be 13,000 soldiers killed, 19,000 civilians killed, mm -hmm. which for urban combat in the Middle East is a very normal ratio. I, can see, if, I if, see what you're you saying at, if you wanted to look at it cold and objectively. Yeah. Well, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Look at things cold and objectively before we come up with a foreign policy or some sort of cultural movement to influence our foreign policy, number one. Number two, lost in the shuffle there is a very important point that Coleman Hughes made that I've been trying to make here on a regular basis, which is God, the Hamas does not distinguish between civilians and soldiers because the soldiers don't dress like soldiers. They dress like civilians. They live with civilians. They hide amongst the civilians. They embed themselves in civilians. All are violations of the Geneva Conventions when it comes to warfare, but only one side of this conflict is held up against those Geneva Conventions. Only one side of this conflict is constantly lectured to and reprimanded about their so-called violations of war crime statutes. Uh, Hamas, this entire conflict this entire war started with a violation of all conventions having to do with appropriate uh, warfare tactics when Hamas slaughtered over a thousand civilians for enjoying a music festival Joe Biden yesterday was lecturing Bibi Netanyahu about waging a war there and imagine being Bibi Netanyahu being through the wars going all the way back to the Yom Kippur war in the 1972 war, literally fighting, taking a bullet and seeing his brother die. And you got to sit on the phone and tolerate Joe freaking Biden telling you how to fight a war. But he's giving pointers to Bibi about what he's supposed to be doing. Do you remember Joe Biden lecturing in any way the leader of Hamas about what they should and shouldn't do? Shocking. Maybe he should. Maybe he should try that. But he's too much of a coward. But th there's more here, though. It's great. But well, I don't, I don't, still, I hope it doesn't come across cold because, but it's mostly women and children that are dying, that are, that are dying because they're in a place where these terrorists are. Right. I mean, this is, it's not because the terrorists on purpose embed themselves with the civilian population, right. which is a war crime, right. which is a strategy that they have clearly employed when yeah. you see them. And when, when the IDF went into that hospital and found uh, the Hamas just and, recently. Yes. Yeah. So it's real. It's not just a conspiracy theory. We know that that's real. Um, but it's still, you're still talking about 20,000, whatever it is, of innocent people getting bombed into the Stone Age. And then there's this, like, what are the pressures that are being put on people that are trying to deliver aid? How difficult yeah. is it? So my understanding of the aid issue, uh, and I, I've looked into it, quite a bit is that the aid is getting into gaza uh they, they've they've gotten over a quarter ton of food into gaza since the beginning of the war which is pretty similar to the food that was getting in the problem is it's not getting to the people it's especially in the north because the north is a war zone so it's getting through the border israel's allowing it in but then what happens is the IDF doesn't control the delivery. The delivery is controlled by humanitarian organizations like UNRWA and just other, a whole bevy of humanitarian organizations. And they have these aid convoys going to people, but then Hamas hijacks it, random gang of people, uh, Palestinians hijack it, hungry civilians hijack it. Uh, and it's an absolute mess in terms of distributing the aid. And that's why you see, and it was a problem in the war in Iraq too. What was... Just a real fast uh, uh, adjustment here on these numbers, um, because I think he, uh, Coleman Hughes misspoke there. It's not a quarter ton. It's actually tens of tons of of aid that have been sent in at this point. 
Um, some estimates put it over uh, 20 tons. Uh, Turkey sends 40,000 tons. I mean, I, we don't know. We, we can give you the full number. I just don't want anyone to be misled. But he, he misspoke uh, about how many tons of aid have been brought in there. But we did see a video just yesterday, I think it was, or maybe it was Monday, of the... Um, of the uh, woman from Israel who was basically laying out the map. Oh, you know what? I didn't do it on the show. I did it on I did it on my radio show. Uh, basically, Israel has provided enough tons of food for Gaza right now to feed them for an entire year. Of course, the war's only gone on for six months, but they have Israel personally has delivered that much aid into the Gaza territories for a year. So there's plenty of food there. If it doesn't get to the people, it's because that's what Hamas wants, because they want the headlines. They literally want the headlines of starving children and women and mothers and the elderly because they know that that helps their political goals. Understand something. Hamas, Israel's enemy, and really the enemy of all free people on this planet, they are fine with their people dying if it means they get their political goal. And make no mistake, their political goal is the absolute abolition of the Israeli state. So we need to keep reminding ourselves of that as we discuss these issues. The case when it was being reported, it's very difficult to know when, you know, you're getting the Hamas version of a story and then you're getting the Israeli version of a story. What happened when there was the aid truck and, and people started getting shot? The one last night? No, it was a while ago. Oh, okay. So yes, the, that, that, was, that one, that was a couple of weeks ago that I don't, I don't have the full detailed version of, up to date of what happened there but i believe it was it had something to do with a, a clash between the idf and other palestinians that were involved in distributing the aid because what you have is you have hamas but you also have powerful families in gaza that you could call them sort of criminal syndicates or whatever but they're powerful important families as well that are also taking the aid sometimes and these are the families that if if Israel is allowed and goes into Rafah and defeats Hamas, one of the possibilities that, is that they want to get these powerful Palestinian families to take over the Gaza Strip. And these people are also involved in, in, uh, in the distribution of aid or in the hoarding of aid or in the stealing of aid or in the uh, taking of aid and then selling it for very high prices on the secondary market, which is why it may not be getting to everyone in the north. So but are it's, those it's not the because... people that the Israeli soldiers shot? No, I think it, it, I think it turned into a, it could have been a panic firefight, and they killed they killed civilians. What caused the panic firefight? I don't I don't think there's details. That I don't know. So the that accusation one I don't was that they were shooting people that were trying yes. to get aid. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but what we saw on the drone footage of that attack, I'm sure you saw it too, is that there were no idea of soldiers on the ground. The trucks came in. Hamas was trying to take it all. The people were swarming the trucks trying to get the food, and Hamas started shooting people. What caused the panic attack? People were starving because Hamas has kept food from their people and hoarded all of the supplies for themselves. That's on a regular basis, you'll see video footage of the aid trucks going into Gaza and they're boarded by Hamas terrorists with guns who are keeping everybody away from the trucks. Because they're evil. And you don't think that's tr the case? I, I think it's very unlikely. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Absolutely. There, there My is... assumption is that there is going to be war crimes in this right. war. Right. Because, and I know Kurt would probably say I'm, I'm, I'm doing the tragedy of war thing. But it's actually a legitimate point in every single war, even the just ones. There are war crimes by berserk soldiers, by the good guys. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's genocide. And that doesn't mean it's not a just war. That That is a very important point, the war crimes thing. Because I think when you're asking someone to follow and obey rules, when you're also asking them to murder people that they don't even know. And that these are the bad people. Like, you have it in your head that those are the people that you have to kill and you're getting shot at and you're watching your friends die and you're, you know, two years into this now, whatever it is, you know, when you're in Ukraine, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, you're two years into getting shot at and like, I'm sure they do some horrific shit if they catch people or if they get someone that they think is on the other side or someone who looks like they're on the other side. It's you're, you're asking a person to do, an insanely evil and horrific thing, but then stop when the rules don't apply. And some people are not going to do that. That's right. 
And I think that the fundamental difference between Israel and Hamas is Israeli society, however imperfectly, is not going to celebrate the monsters on their own side when they're really found to be monsters. They're That's not gonna point. they're not gonna hand out candies to people who kill Palestinian civilians like Hamas does. Um, in, in reverse. And so my feeling about it is still that, you know, any nation that suffered what Israel did on October 7th, everyone in the country would be saying, you have to go get these guys. You have to eliminate this organization that did this. And if they're, and they're 80% finished with that job, it would make no sense at this point to stop before you've cut out the last 20% of the cancer or before you've put out the last 20% of the fire. Right. E even with all of the absolute suffering that is real on the Palestinian side, you know, so that that's how I feel about it. And I, I think it's really it's very, very distinct from genocide because genocide is when you're trying to maximize civilian casualties. I think Israel, however, imperfectly is doing the opposite. They're trying to minimize civilian casualties. That's interesting. Um, what would people say? that would um, disagree with you when they talk about targeting mosques, targeting hospitals. And we know that some of the targeting hospital stories are just not true. Like the New York Times printed a story. Saying so this goes on, and I suggest you watch it as well. Go check out Joe Rogan's center. Let's face it, Joe Rogan conversations go on for hours. But you see what Joe Rogan did there is that that's interesting. That's a good point. That's interesting. And then finally, he's left with the the pivot interview option, which is, well, what would the people who disagree with you say? And he raised the bombing of hospitals and said, but of course, we know that most of the hospital bombings, no, all of the hospital bombings were not what we were told they were when they started. And oh, by the way, Hamas hides in the hospitals. And we know that to be an absolute fact right now. So on and on and on, you see that what started as Joe Rogan suggesting that Israel is on the brink of genocide of the Palestinian people in Gaza and are just as guilty as Hamas confronted with facts in a reasonable and logical way, Joe Rogan sort of went on a little seven or eight minute journey there and said, yeah, okay, those are all really good points. Yeah, right. And that's what we have to do. And stop listening to all the people screaming on either side of any issue about how uh, the other side is just evil incarnate and all those other things. If, if you've got somebody in front of you who disagrees with you on something as fundamental as this, you just sit down and reasonably talk through the facts and it's kind of impossible to disagree, ultimately. A another example of talking to somebody and trying to explore in a rational and critical way how they're wrong about an important issue uh, is displayed in this next video that we want to share with you. Now, the last time we saw this guy, his name is Warren Smith. Secret Scholar Society is his YouTube channel. And you'll remember he uh, sat and talked through with a student about their uh, presupposition that J.K. Rowling was a bigot. And by the end of the video, by saying, well, what did she do that was a bigot? Well, what did she say? Well, what did this? What did that? And what do you think of that? The kid who he was talking to, I think it's a college student, basically said, oh, well, OK, yeah, I guess that's wrong. Again, a great example of talking through with facts and logic in a reasonable way about presuppositions that people all have to assume and and take on as their conventional wisdom. Everybody knows Trump's a racist. Well, hold on a minute. Let's talk that through for a second. Uh, this is exactly how we grownups should be talking with people. Uh, and uh, Warren Smith has a great new version of that. It has to do with one of the students that he saw in his classroom wearing uh, Soviet and communist paraphernalia. You know, we see these guys with Che Guevara shirts all the time without even knowing who Che Guevara is. By the way, before this video is shot, uh, Warren had to respond to people who were, you know, ticked off about the lighting, because what you're going to see here is uh, nothing but the light coming through the back window behind him. He said, sorry about the lighting. The camera was on auto and adjusted to the light outside the window automatically. It was a bit spontaneous. So here's that spontaneous conversation. Are you aware of the th flaws of communist countries historically and the mass death that has occurred in communist countries as a result of communism you are but you still wear the communist logos on your t-shirts yeah um okay so i am aware of that i'm not i'm not condoning that at all like i do not like when like a lot of people die that's not a good thing um 
it's basically the idea for me, honestly. Like I think about the idea and I think that's cool. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a cultural thing for me. Like I do like the culture around it. I like um, how sometimes they like get like a bunch of people together, make them basically like patriots, you know, like the overall idea of communism. I kind of like like the free health care, like no landlords, you know. This is going to be good, I promise, and it's really well reasoned, and you're going to like how this goes. But I am going to interrupt once in a while, because even that, I just like the cultural implications around a hammer and sickle. This is a kid in college. How the hell did we get here? What the hell is happening in our public schools right now? How do people? How do kids get out of high school without recognizing exact the evil that the hammer and sickle has represented for the last hundred years? From the tens of millions murdered by Mao to the tens of millions murdered by Stalin to North Korea to Cuba to Venezuela to anywhere. Yeah, how how can you wear communist paraphernalia? And say, well, I just like the cultural implications around it. it. It's just it still boggles my mind. I know I'm being naive because I actually think that there should be an education linked with our public schools, which there isn't not an actual education about history or facts or anything like that. But every once in a while, when I hear something like that from someone who's the age of one of my children, I just, I just, I want to scream. But how, oh, let's watch how this is handled. So what makes you think that healthcare is free because someone has to pay for it? So where does that money come from in a communist country? Um, the state would pay for it. And, and where does um, the state get the money? From taxes, right? So where do the taxes come from? The people. So the, are the people paying for the health care? To an extent, yeah. How would you define communism? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would define it as a society that would give you a job based on your needs and abilities. So it would actually be the government controlling the means of production. Pretty much. Right. So as opposed to capitalism, where it is a competitive marketplace based on individuals striving in their, for their own interests, communism would be the interest of the state over the individual. So it sounds like you like the idea of the group rather than the individual because you're concerned about the individual. But have you considered what that would actually be like, how that would impact your personal freedoms and your ability to conduct yourself? I have thought about that. And what are your thoughts on that? So since I have personally had struggles with finding jobs, I think that that would be a good thing for people like me so then they could get basically assigned a job so then they can make a living. So would you rather be assigned a job or rather have the free choice to choose the job that fulfills your passion and your interests? Uh, that's kind of a tricky question. I don't know if I'm really the best person to ask about this because honestly, since I have had trouble, had troubles, finding jobs in the past, I think it would be nice to have like that extra help. Because the, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this because the pattern I've seen with unions, for example, in Hollywood. So you have to be within a union. If you are in, within a union and you take a non-union job, you get blacklisted by that union, which is the pattern we see in communist countries. So the recent writer's strike resulted in mandates where you have to have, if I'm going to create a television show, I have, I'm required to have a certain number, seven writers on the show, which then drives up costs, which then makes it more expensive to produce the shows, which then means fewer actual job opportunities. I'm not sure if we fully, if these students fully understand what can occur. Yeah. Like if it's not, like if it's not done properly and like there's a person in the higher ups who's super greedy, it can ruin like the whole idea of it. And I've seen that before and some countries like Pol Pot basically killed half his population. Like I don't agree with those actions. Like the, like the idea of communism is good, but if someone commits actions like that, then it's not a good thing. 
Hey, at least you knew who Pol Pot was. I'm going to give him that. That's impressive, right? He must have seen a movie or something. But do you do you see how when when pressed on exactly what communism does and what works and what doesn't work and what's evil and what isn't evil and what violates your freedoms and what doesn't violate freedoms, the whole thing boiled down to it appears that uh, they'll help you find a job if you're having trouble. I, I just like that. I had trouble finding a job and I think I'd like the extra help. Help? So I've had trouble finding a job. I want extra help. So let's just hand over the control of all means of production and capital in our society to the state. And I do like that, you know, as long as there's not somebody greedy at the top. Hey, a quick follow-up question. Setting aside your Pol Pot example, which is a really good one, can you show me any example of communism? Over the course of the last, what are we going on, 115, 120 years now since it started in the Soviet Union? First time it was actually tried in full force. Can you show me any example, just one example, where that didn't happen? Because it seems to happen every single time, every single country that institutes this great utopian nirvana of, you know, a job fair. It's just a job fair, really. It's just helping people get jobs. Can you show me any example where it hasn't actually been a murderous, totalitarian, authoritarian regime where those at the top end up being the greedy overlords over everybody else? And hey, if you have to crack a few eggs to make an omelet and people are slaughtered for the benefit of helping the state and we're the only few who are actually in charge of the state so certainly it benefits us but don't you know we're your superiors even though i claim to treat everybody equally well if those few eggs need to be cracked and people have to die to serve the state that's a small price to pay how many countries over how many decades do we have to see this happen over and over and over and over again and you still get a brain full of mush, as Rush Limbaugh used to call them, responding like this. But I'm glad that Warren Smith, this is a great video. He has really great videos. You should subscribe over at Secret Scholar Society. I'm glad that he asked some pretty pertinent questions and didn't just let this guy walk past him wearing a hammer and sickle and maybe Che Guevara or whatever other kind of communist paraphernalia they had. And he just said, hey, can I talk to you about this? I'm curious. What's the deal with that? Oh, well, you know, I like the free health care. Really? Where's that free health care come from? I mean, that one got dispensed with quickly. And then as you start chipping away and chipping away, ultimately, the real power of a communist state is that if you're having trouble finding a job, they'll help you get one. And that's how nations are toppled. You're going to love this. There is nothing more dangerous in our society right now than white suburban women with some extra money lying around and a whole lot of white guilt. Ever since uh, Ibram X. Candy and uh, Ms. D'Angelo started writing books and going on the speaking trail and MSNBC cable news appearances, ever since then, white suburban women have been falling over themselves to try to figure out how to purge themselves from their white privilege. And it reached the point now where they spend a ton of money on very fancy dinner parties just so they can be berated and insulted by black dinner guests. White women are socialized to be nice. And part of that niceness means you don't come to a beautifully prepared dinner table and then leave because something upsets you. So we know they'll stay. So that's why we use the dinner. How many of you at this table think that you're racist? Welcome to Race to Dinner. How many of you at this table, you nice white people, would actually happily trade places with a black person in this society? Disclaimer, the following contains blunt and honest conversations about racism. We have the hostess prepare a crying room, so when your white lady feelings get hurt, you can go in the room and have at it. Disclaimer, no white women were harmed in the making of this report. In 30 seconds, we establish, you know, that you all are racist, and that you know the hierarchy, uh, black at the bottom, white at the top, and the rest of us somewhere in between. The goal is to have radically honest conversations. You know, I'm old enough to have 
demonstrated and marched in the 60s, okay? And what I know is as a society, we don't have honest conversations about race. During Cyber Rao's unsuccessful run for Congress in 2018, she found her schedule overflowing with coffee dates and campaign events. At every event, like line of white ladies wrapped around the, the door waiting to talk to me, to tell me, not me, not all white women. My platform was anti-racism. Not me, you've got me wrong. Denver native Regina Jackson worked on Cyrus' campaign and thought to consolidate these one-on-one -on -one anti-racism discussions into a dinner. So we did it. We just did one of these dinners and it was full white women in the Broadway musical. You know, crying, arms folded, eyes rolled, pacing around the dinner table. And uh, we posted about it on Facebook and it went viral. I should have educated them. The dinners, which continue to grow in popularity, have taken place from Denver to Chicago to Toronto. A white woman chooses to host at her home for a group of seven friends. The price of the two-hour dinner, $5,000. You know... I... My only reaction so far is, how in the hell can I get in on this scam? Do you pay 5000 bucks? you invite six of your friends over, and I get to call you names all through the table. And, and we have a crying womb set up because I get to call you so many names that you're going to end up being moved to tears. Let's freaking go. Why? I, I could do that. I'd do it for half that. I'd do it for $2,500. All you liberal suburban white women invite six of your friends over. You supply the food. I'll supply the tears. I got plenty to say to y'all. Plenty. Oh, how racist you are? That's just scratching the surface. This is actually kind of brilliant if you think about it. I'm not, I was going to be outraged over this, but I'm not. These, these people are brilliant. They're absolutely fantastic. I'm jealous, is what I am. I'm also a little outraged, but, but not at the people who host the dinners. Hold on. $5,000. You know why? People are worked up about this because white people think that them doing this work is charity and we should be paying them. So even a penny would be too much. Thank you. Race to Dinner's message can now be consumed you. through a New York Times bestseller and a documentary. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Want to sign your book? All geared for white women who acknowledge their unchecked biases and are looking to purge the Karen inside of them. That's great. I'd like to purge some Karens as well. Uh, here's the thing. This is this is this is my suggestion to all of the white women who are involved in this and volunteer for this and spend their money on this so that they can feel good about their racism, I guess, at the end of the day. You know what? I don't think white suburban wealthy women who are racist should be allowed to vote. Now, of course, I don't think we should have a law that says that, although I would entertain it depending on the language of the statute. But I will say this. If you women truly feel that guilty, if you recognize how racist you are and how you are just drowning in white privilege and that and that you would never trade places with another black person, as you said earlier at the table, and that you acknowledge that your actions, your inactions, your opinions, your wealth, your free mobility, your spending power, that you have contributed to the debilitating systemic racism in our society. Let me tell you something. After you host your dinner and you fork over your five grand, the next thing, in fact, the only thing that you should do to right these historic wrongs and to, and to in some way reduce the impact of your hateful racism in our society. What you white women need to do, you white suburban wealthy women need to do, you need to not vote this fall. This November, you need to stay home because you staying home will actually elevate the vote of your black counterparts. Especially if you're single, by the way. If you are a single white suburban woman, don't vote. It's racist if you vote. In fact, if you vote, you are you are silencing and disenfranchising a black person's vote. Because who knows, you might vote in a different way. You probably will because you're racist. So stay home and do not vote. That's the only thing you can do to actually right your past wrongs and the wrongs of your mother, your grandmother, and your great-grandmother. Just do it. Just do it. Just don't vote. Stay. I, I don't want anyone involved in this project to vote. And I think that'll really make an impact. Don't tell them. 
Meanwhile, we got a congresswoman who has a really creative new idea for reparations. Because, by the way, you are racist, and so you should pay reparations. Uh, but you're going to love this. It's actually a great idea. Just this past week, I saw, I don't remember which celebrity, but it was actually a celebrity. And I was like, I don't know that that's not necessarily a bad idea. But I'd have to think through it a lot. One of the things that they propose is Black folk not have to pay taxes for a certain amount of time. Because then again, that puts money back in your pocket. But at the same time, it may not be as objectionable to some people about actually giving out dollars. But obviously, then you start dealing with the different tax brackets and things like that. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, we argue the reparations make sense because so many black folk, not only do you owe for the labor that was stolen and killed and all the other things, right? But the fact is, like, we end up being so far behind, right? And so it's like, how do you bring fourth people gap. exactly and so it's like if you if you do the no tax thing for people that are already say struggling and aren't really paying taxes in the first place it doesn't really exactly they may, they may want those those checks like they got ex 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 exactly <laughs> jamie crockett congresswoman jamie crockett that's the idea instead of just handing out money for reparations, let's just suspend taxes and black people don't need to pay any taxes, okay? How's that for a plan? I mean, it's the least that you can do. Although it took the reporter there who's kind of giggling at the end, uh, it took her to sort of realize the fallacy in the whole plan because if black people are due reparations because of slavery 150 years ago, and reparations need to be paid because they still are faced with systemic problems to advance and get ahead in our society. And the only way to right that wrong is to give them reparations so they can be lifted out of poverty. If that's the case, well, then right now we actually do have a, a bottom limit on an annual salary as to what you would have to pay taxes on. And if you are below the poverty line and literally living in poverty, not only do you not pay taxes, but you actually get a tax credit right now. It's called the earned income tax credit that you have to pay. I believe that's what it's called, right? The EIT, isn't that what it's called? So if you make a salary below a certain amount, not only do you not pay taxes, but you actually get a tax benefit through your taxes, extra money, free money that you get. In fact, the only people who are actually paying taxes in our society that would benefit from a tax credit under the guise of reparations are people who are making over, what is it now, median 70,000 a year for a household or more. And of course, 90% of the, 1% of the population pays for uh, like a giant percentage, like 80% of the actual revenue in this country. So I, I guess the point is the only black people who will benefit from this tax credit are the wealthy ones and upper middle class black people who I'm told don't exist because of slavery, because <laughs> that's the whole reason we need the reparations. I don't think Congresswoman Crockett thought this through. After all, she did get the idea from a celebrity. But when it comes to race baiting and reverse racism and pointing your anger at white people because of bad things going on in the black community. Nothing's better than this Memphis city councilwoman who, when complaining about crime in her district, perpetrated by young African-Americans against other African-Americans, where the victims are black and the criminals are black, she has discovered who's to blame. The white man. You know, I hear all the time, I'm a native Memphian and, 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 and we, you know, well, act like it. Let's work together and act like it. Our children, it's our children that look like me that are being killed daily. The four-year-old just got killed. I mean, we can go on and 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 on. But state legislators hate us here in Memphis, Tennessee, and they hate black folks in Memphis, Tennessee. And that's just point blank, because it's us that's killing one another. 
But then we talk about and we want to compare ourselves to other cities, but other cities ain't dealing with the prejudiced white boys that's on the hill, that's making these laws and legislation, that's making sure that Memphis, Tennessee does not progress and that we do not change our habits and the forms and the way that we're doing things. Other cities ain't dealing with what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people on the hill that make state legislation laws that know that we have a problem and then we get here in the city and then we beat each other up because we want a quick fix to something we can't fix because they are trumping everything that we're trying to do here. And so and then you get beat up, everybody get beat up, all these hard questions come and all these forensic. What we should be doing is marching down there on that hill and making them understand this is not working here in Memphis for us because every, every TV, every channel I look to, they look like me. And we're getting numb and ain't nobody marching, ain't nobody protesting, ain't nobody saying anything. But sitting here, meeting after meeting, blaming someone and it's on the hill where they hate us at, where they don't like us because this is a predominantly black city run by a predominantly almost black council. Everything you look at is black, 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 black. I love, I love the one white dude sitting next to her not even paying attention and eating something. through. Why are they all wearing masks, by the way? the hell is going on here that's yolanda cooper sutton memphis city councilwoman blaming all of the black on black crime in memphis on i believe she said can i yeah i'm gonna quote her the white boys on the hill the white boys up there in the state legislature who hate all of the black people and she just said you know i look on television i see all the victims and i see the criminals and they all look like me she says pointing to her black skin they all look like me and uh, if I were that white dude sitting next to in case I just didn't want to bother with it and just, you know, can we move on with the meeting, please? Because I don't want to get my hands dirty with this kind of topic. But if I actually cared about the truth, if I actually cared about healing this nation, if I actually cared about advancing the interests of all people in the city of Memphis with this race baiting bigot sitting next to me, I would actually stay. I, I have a question for Yolanda, for Yolanda Cooper Sutton. You just said that it's the white people's fault for the crime in your neighborhood. It's the white people's fault that black people are mugging, raping, and murdering and assaulting other black people in our city. Can I ask you something? You said that they all look like you. Do you mug, rape, assault, and murder people? Do you? Have you? Do you plan to? Can you envision yourself doing that? I would think the answer is no, Yolanda, right? You're not going to do anything like that, would you? You wouldn't mug anybody. You wouldn't assault anybody. You wouldn't rape. You wouldn't murder, would you? Right? You wouldn't, would you? No, you wouldn't. Good. Oh, thank goodness. I figured that was the case. So let me just ask you a question. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? After all, you're black. And it's the racist white boys, as you called them, that are creating a situation and passing legislation because they hate you to create the environment where young black men in Memphis with no control over themselves just find themselves murdering and assaulting and mugging and raping. And of course, it's not their fault. You won't blame them. You're blaming the, how would you call it? white boys on the hill well what makes you so special how are you immune from all their racism why aren't you out there murdering people yolanda why wouldn't you do that and until yolanda can answer that question then she really needs to rethink her position on how it's white men and their racism that has caused all of the violence in Memphis right now, perpetrated by predominantly black people against other black people. Because if it's true that it's just racism and the murderers and rapists and muggers in Memphis can't control themselves and they have no actual responsibility for their behavior, because what are you going to do? It's racist white boys who are making us do it. Well, then. I don't see why she shouldn't be considered a suspected rapist because she's just this a hair trigger away from doing the exact same thing, right? Because that's how we're supposed to judge each other. That's how we're supposed to prejudge each other based on the color of their skin, right? That's what you're teaching us, Yolanda. Or is there something else at play here? Maybe there's some, maybe that thing that's keeping you 
from being a murderer. Maybe that thing is missing over there with these people, and it has absolutely literally nothing to do with state law. Maybe. Could be wrong. You know what? Let's host a dinner party with seven white women, and that'll make you feel better because you can tell them how racist they are and how they're responsible for the crime, and it'll certainly make them feel better. But one thing we can all agree on, no one at that dinner party should be able to vote this November. That's it for today's show. We'll be back on Rumble tomorrow live again. If you liked any of the segments that we did today, please, we're going to break those videos out. I'd love for you to like them individually, watch them again, and share them with your friends. I bet you've got somebody in your life that would love to see a video that we did today. So please do share them and like them and subscribe to our audio podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you like your podcast. That way you never miss an episode like the one we're going to do tomorrow. We'll see you then. But until then, I'm Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry.